ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cropper here. I'd like to do a video on David Bohm, physicist. Uh, I know virtually nothing about him. Some videos on YouTube about him. And he sounds like, um, like an anarchist or something sounds compared to a socialist. The anarchist says, no, why should the government have power over me? No, I want freedom. You know, and then, and then later on you say, uh, you say, well, we need a military to protect us. No, why should the military exist? Just, you know, just try to exist without a military. Somebody with a military will come and take over your land and kill you. Well, David Bohm sounds like that uh, as far as physicists go. He has nonsense in there, and he says some good things, and he hides it behind sophistry, which he himself probably doesn't understand. So I'm going to go through... Uh, playlist that I have in my channel. It's like the second to last one down at the very bottom if you go and look for it, I believe. David Bohm Physicist. That's all it says, I think. And I'm just going to listen to his video and then say a few things about it and listen to it again and say a few things about it. And the first video on the playlist is about two minutes long, three minutes long, and he talks about fragmentation. And then there's a five-part video interview. Now, in the part about fragmentation, uh, a way of understanding particles, as fragmented as we might see it, there, there are different parts, and we have to look at the parts within each one of the different parts and so on. And he says, we have to remember that it is all part of a whole, W-H-O-L-E. We cannot start focusing in on each teeny tiny little fragment and then focus further in on the fragments that come from that fragment and further in on the fragments that come from that fragment. We have to remember that it is all part of a whole system. I believe that's what quantum physics does. It focuses very, very closely on individual singular events and doesn't care to try to discover the general laws. Like, uh, if you just focus in on, on how the moon goes around the Earth and don't care about anything else, and you just focus in all the details of that because you don't think that we can relate you know, the way that the moons go around Jupiter be different. It's different. It's fragmented. It's different. That's a different part. That doesn't necessarily apply here. Wrong. Gravity applies everywhere. So we have to look at it as a whole. Then he says the very fact that we're not looking at it as a whole tends to make us become even more fragmented, uh, in our view. Breaks things up even more thoroughly than we all already have artificially sort of broken them up. Uh, and I think that's a valuable lesson to remember when you're uh, thinking about quantum mechanics and their supposed uh, results to their supposed experiments. He makes the example that we can't cut the world up into nations and then say each nation is completely independent from the others. They do actually share something. And then say that each part within the nation is separate from all the others. They do actually share something. There is a background reality. Uh, and so on down to the minutest particle. There is a background reality. It doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's not a fragmented individual piece. It is part of the universe. Something that he is very concerned physicists have completely uh, forgotten and don't worry about at all anymore. Now it's fine for him to say we have to remember to look at the whole view and not be so fragmented. But I think that that is a nuanced or uh, stealthy way, an undercover way of saying that we have to remember there are laws that apply everywhere in the universe. We have to remember the power of induction. We have to remember our ability to make generalizations. We have to remember our ability to discover things that apply everywhere, even places we haven't seen or experimented yet. We have to remember that, he says. That's how I take it. That's what I take his epistemic meaning to be. Unfortunately, he is actually couching his theories in the language and terminology of the Kantian epistemologists. So um, it, it's kind of like the people, on the one side people said uh, you can never know anything. The subjectivists in the history of philosophy say you can never know anything, you're just the subject peering out into a world. You never know if it's the same for you or anybody else, right? You can never know anything. So the empiricists come back and they say yes, you can only know things actually that you can actually get with the five senses. So, for example, atoms, they don't believe in the existence of atoms because you can't get them with five senses. So it's someone answering someone who's wrong, who's part of, part of their answer is wrong. That's David Bohm. And uh, so let's go on to the interview now. That's the end of the very first prelude video. Now, the interviewer asks him, are your ideas going to be easily accepted or are they easily accepted at places like the Niels Bohr Institute? He says, well, I haven't done much here. But he says, scientists in general find it harder to accept 
my views than the populace, than the regular public. He says, because the scientists are really stuck with the old atomistic view of the universe. And I don't know what exactly he means by that. But he says uh, that he, he thinks it's important that the scientists, uh, they're stuck in this way, and they're explaining everything in this way, this view that they have. But he says it's got very deep and important implications. Looking at the universe just with a, a you know, microscope, always focused into the highest power. That's not the way to look at the universe, he says. And he says, ordinary people seem to be able to understand the logic of his theories better than academia. Surprise. Now he mentions starting about 4 minutes and 30 seconds in the first video in the interview. He talks about wave-particle duality. He says there's this idea in, in modern relativity and, uh, and s uh, quantum mechanics. There's the idea that sometimes a, a light wave will act like a wave and sometimes like a particle. And then he says that the old school idea is that whether it's a particle or a wave at any given minute is intrinsic. It's true in reality. We don't have to measure it to look and see. It's true. If we do measure it to look and see, we'll find something. But what we find is intrinsic in reality. There's an indep independent reality. That's what was true in the old way. And then he's talking about what people are believing today. Now, at 505, he starts mentioning uh, the entanglement of particles that are connected through instantaneous um, communication, uh, instantaneous for all intents and, and purposes. And now he says this is evidence that the universe is an indivisible whole. That when you get right down to sub sub subatomic particles, they aren't even separate, even though they're separate. Everything is one. Trying to get people to come back away from the fragmentation view, the view that uh, we have to focus in with our microscope all the time. We can never take a macroscopic view. We can never generalize. We can never infer anything. Uh, we can only go. This is worse than the people who only go on evidence because they don't even use evidence anymore. They just use math, like string theory. No evidence needed. Um, and, uh, and modern cosmology, no evidence needed. They don't even care about the evidence, but they just focus in on the smallest particles and then the smartest poly small smallest particles from those and so on down. And they are losing the worldview, which he says is intrinsically available to be seen during entanglement, the fact that particles are entangled uh, instantaneously. Now he gives a, 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 an analogy of uh, electrons which are fundamentally linked. They are fundamentally some sort of function which is one and the same thing, linked over a distance even when they're not together. Uh, now this entanglement helps explain possibly what goes on in the double slit experiment, supposedly. Supposedly, when you look at it one way, it changes from when you look at it another way. But, you fire the electrons at uh, two slits, and they act like a wave. Fire them at one slit, and it looks like particles when it comes through the other side. He says, uh, the particles um, will come back together. We know they will, if they go through the slit, the two slits. Which slit does the light wave go through? Well, either one it goes through, by the way, it goes through both. Either one that it goes through, it's going to be recombined with itself back on the other side because they are connected through this uh, entanglement, the intrinsic wholeness of everything. Everything in the universe is intrinsically one. We can tell by the fact that electrons communicate instantaneously. I don't know if, I don't know if I'm willing to go that far, but it is a much more reasonable view than the view that perception creates reality, right? He says that it's like two ballerinas uh, or two dancers dancing along on the floor and there's a pillar in the middle of the dance floor and they separate to go around it and then they come back together. And they're always together in a certain way because they're planning to come back together and they would have to come back together. The dance couldn't continue. Uh, except instead of the willpower of the dancers, we have a law of nature substituting the electrons. So he says this is a better way to look at it. Um, we need to remember that the electrons and the entanglement field and everything else is part of an entire reality. We need to keep that part in mind, he says, the fact that it's not, we can't focus in on a little teeny tiny speck.